Hello and welcome to another episode of Reporting Depp v Heard. Why, you might be thinking, is he not in the quiet confines of Fairfax County Court? Why has he decided to come and film his opening to this episode in front of a busy freeway by the metro station? The reason is really too tedious to go into, other than the fact that Uber wanted to charge me $112 to get to court this morning, so I'm exploring the public transport links in the Fairfax County area. This is the metro station. There is a bus behind me. Um, but that's basically all about my adventures of trying to get to court on a limited budget and not having to pay the $112 that uh, Uber wanted this morning. I tried going by metro really, really early this morning. Uh, failed, downloaded Lyft, got in the Lyft for half that $112, but that's still quite a lot of money and eventually turned up uh, quite far towards the back of a very long line this morning, which you can see now. It's by far the longest line that you will have seen in the entirety of the, uh, well, three weeks that this trial has gone into. This is the day one of week three. And to debrief it, uh, I've invited back Becca Fontanilla because we wanted to have a chat not only about what we saw in court today, but the reaction to some of the way that I've been reporting over the weekend has caused a bit of a stir in some sections. So we thought we'd address that as well. And I'm delighted to Becca for sparing the time to do so in, my, in her second park bench interview. I'll be back at the end to give you a bit more waffle about what may or may not be happening in court tomorrow from uh, Vienna Metro Station, right at the end of the orange line, I think it is, out of DC. Laters. Hello, here we are for park bench interview, what feels like 936 but it's only day one of week three or day nine or day eight if you don't count the jury selection i'm sure we'll settle on a day eventually but it is monday the 25th of april 2022 we're into week three of depth v heard and i'm delighted to welcome back to a park bench interview for this episode becca fontanilla hello hello becca how are you i'm i'm good Good. Um, take me through today's <coughs> events. What stuck out for you? There was a lot of context rebuilding to yes. texts and audio, wasn't there? So what, 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 take me through that. So to recap from his cross, it was listening to audios, asking if it's him in the audios, but then not really asking con, you know, context or anything, and then moving on to another piece of evidence. Yeah. And it was kind of this rapid fire, here's the evidence, does this sound correct? Here's the evidence. And that happened a lot this morning, didn't it? Yeah. There was the reading of a text. Have I just read that text out correctly? Yes. But that doesn't confirm anything. You don't hear the context of it. So in redirect, his lawyers did a really great job of trying to touch on what they wanted to touch on while at the same time touching on the out of context items that were brought up. So. Yes. And so what stuck out for you? I mean, the, 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 the two ones that stuck out for me were the two blindingly obvious jokes. There was the, uh, the Monty Python sort of skit taken to the nth degree, which did, you know, you could see it in certain contexts as offensive if you don't like fruity, salty language. Um, but it was clearly an exaggeration for comic effect of two private texts between yep. himself and Paul Bettany. Yeah, yeah. And then there was the, uh, the, the we, we've got some, uh, was it? We've got whores and animals. Oh, yeah, and Mike Tyson. And yeah. it was a wild animal party or something. Which, which yeah. he said, well, was, was, which was quite sad that he had to explain that it was a joke. But also it was a private joke between him and his personal assistant to sort of kind of partly wind him up and partly to make him laugh, wasn't yeah. it? But, you know, there was and this, it was a movie plot. It was, yeah, it was taken from The Hangover, as he said in right. court today. But, I mean, the fact that we had to spend five minutes of court time explaining to the jury that, yes, that was and that had nothing to do, a joke. And that had nothing to do with him and Amber. No, but there were, there were other areas that I felt he was a little shakier on when trying to give context to that uh, email exchange with Amber or text exchange with Amber about her being at a coffee meeting and he sort of flew off the yeah. handle saying, well, what's that to do with you're not meant to be having meetings about movies. We said no more movies. And the... Um, Amber Heard's attorney said, this is you controlling her, this is controlling mm. behavior. And what was his response? And his was response his was actually, you know, it's good that you had that point of view when you first hear it, right? That's your point of view, that he flew off the handle and says no more whatever, and is he being controlling? But in actuality, he was saying, actually, if you reread this, it's light banter because we had already had plans and she was at a coffee shop doing some sort of an interview of some sort. And, you know, so he just said, you know, it was a light, a light banter. So, and I, I, I'll ask you what you think the most powerful moment of the day was in a moment. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you mine, which was um, because it was so 
impactful, I hate using that word, but it was in the courtroom on Thursday when this clip of audio of Johnny Depp was played where he was asking Amber Heard to cut, and to cut him with a knife and then threatening to cut himself with the knife. And uh, I, I, I made quite a bit of it in my newsletter because I, I, felt, I felt I wanted to get across the impact I felt it had in the courtroom. Today, I don't think we heard, no, we didn't hear the audio, yeah. but Johnny Depp was invited to give the context to it, which was? The context was that he was, he had hit rock bottom. She took everything from him and the only thing he had left to give her was his blood. And so if she didn't cut him, he was going to cut himself. Um, it, and on top of that, she wasn't meant to be there. She was break, she, technically correct. breaking the she terms the of this, of this uh, what's it called, a te temporary restraining order mm -hmm. on him. So he was surprised that she wanted to have this meeting in a hotel room in San Francisco, and he agreed to it through their mutual agent. Yeah. And it, he, just show, it just shows, though, the mental health side of things, which is a very big topic here in America. Mm. I'm not sure. No, 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 no. It no it's, it's a live well. issue in the UK. Yeah. Um, but m mental health, especially discussing this relationship he's at the very end of all these details that we've been given thus far from his side of things where she apparently defecated in his bed and possibly did a whole bunch of other violent things to him which it's it does seem that way based on the evidence in my opinion um, and once he's gone through all of this over the course of about three and a half I believe three and a half or so years He's just, he's just done. And, and like, what more can he give to her, you know? Well, I mean, it's, I suppose to summarize today, the Amber Heard's team spent the morning building up this, this picture, which we've seen built up many, many times before, both here and in the UK, um, that he um, uses violent language, that he drinks too much and takes drugs, and that um, he, is apologizing for unspecified events which they are alluding to the fact would be domestic violence and they, you get you get to that point but actually the, the most striking thing about today was that actually quite an interesting picture of Johnny Depp's desperation and desire just to remove himself get from away. every situation get away. and how sh and we heard some new I think new audio I might be wrong I mean God knows how much audio there is out there there is new audio today yeah where he was reasonably trying to explain why he needed to remove himself from an argument and yeah. she was not letting him I mean she was like I'm going a, to die if you do this I mean in re yeah and, and there wasn't just one piece of audio it was this really troubling thing we're saying you know you must stay and fight it's gonna get worse if you don't stay and fight yes and he was thinking you could tell him just think well that doesn't make any sense and, and trying to back away so you did really I think get a get a sense today that the case that he is putting before the jury has got more dimensions to it than the one he was allowed to put before the judge in the UK. And I, and I, and I you know, I genuinely think that, and I think that's really, really interesting, the way that that came out over the yes. course of the, the direct. Because in the UK, you do get a tiny little bit at the end of a cross-examination where your attorney or counsel or barrister is allowed to um, come back to you to tidy up a couple of points. But judges don't like it if it goes, more, goes on for more than four or five yeah. minutes. So I was, I was interested to see there was a good hour and a half, I would say, of redirect uh -huh. as you guys call it so that so that was interesting and it was a lot of information in the redirect as well yeah yeah know? so new, so i mean although it was it meant was to be referring quick, to the previous fairly quick moving it also yeah. allowed him to speak you know and yeah and he, he you know he was convincingly not emotional at the end but he was convincingly sort of lucid about mm. why things had happened the way that they'd happened i just think that while watching him this is from my perspective and he's either listening to something before he gets questioned or he's speaking about what he's being questioned about. I almost feel like he's still mentally digesting these occurrences. Right. You know, like you can honestly see him reliving or, or picturing in his brain because he closes his eyes when he's listening. It's like it's like it's playing like a movie playing in his head. Yeah. You know, of he the, is quite a circum circumlocutory speaker. Yeah. He said. Um, there was one tweet I saw while I was sort of busy bashing away on the laptop this afternoon, which sort of had Johnny Depp's evidence. And this was the point. And he sort of nearly gets to it yeah. and then comes away. And I mean, you know, maybe that's just we all, I mean, an elliptical way a of speaking. He, I believe he has ADD or ADHD and I do as well. But 
uh, mine is a different type than his, but my daughter has mm. a very similar version of his. Oh, really? Where she kind of gets to it, and then she just, <laughs> and then she just goes, oh, wait, there's this over here. Like, <laughs> It's difficult when you're a TV news editor trying to find edit points. There was a really testy exchange between uh, him and Ben Rottenborn really early this morning where he, he, I think he finished off saying, so long as you're happy, sir. And, and the um, judge, I believe, yeah, uh, might have corrected that moment, or maybe it was a no, it was a later, it was a later moment. one because because oh, okay. Rottenborn was getting a little bit fed up with yeah, it. Yeah. Um, but but the, the the thing that had sparked the exchange to me in my ears sounded about twenty seconds long. But because Johnny Depp takes quite a long time to get to what he was talking about, the whole thing was a minute long. And I had my news editor back in the UK going, "What are we going to do?" And we, we we worked out that I'd have to say what the text said in order to throw to the clip yeah um but it was oh that was the the, the hard hit hit something hard hit the wall hard that's oh, it that that, yeah, that line yeah. and, and he was saying you know it's just a figure of speech but um no I, the, another reason i wanted to speak to you and i'm very grateful to you for coming back to the park bench is because i've got it in the neck over the weekend for a couple of things that i've, I've said and done uh, in my newsletter and my um, interview with 60 minutes uh, australia and this is all part of the learning process for, for all of us, I hope, because I want to try and explain what I'm trying to do with my journalism. And I think um, Becca's got a much better insight than I have on, on the, the way that language about domestic violence and mental health can play out. And, and I, I'm acutely aware that there are a number of people who follow what I'm writing who themselves are domestic, uh, victims of domestic violence. And, I, and I'm not that tightly attuned to triggering language and how that can upset people. Because there's a, in my view, and by all means challenge me on it, but it, in, in my view there's a possible inherent um, conflict of interest. Because as a journalist you're always looking for the strongest line. What is, what is the thing that sticks in your mind? Which in America is considered... Sen sensationalism? Clickbait, sensationalism. Right, so, right exactly. You know. uh, and, and I understand because you know, part of my profession is to get people's eyeballs. And if, you know... If, if there is a subsection of the people who follow what I'm doing who are going to get offended or triggered by what I do, I've also got to sort of think about 90% of people who just themselves aren't going to get triggered and just want to know what the biggest thing has come out of the day. Now, it will be my opinion as to what the biggest thing has come out of the day because it's my journalism. And it's also a sum up of the day. Uh, yeah, because you can't write everything, right. which is, I mean, one of, one of the gifts that I had in London yeah. was that I was able to go, here is everything that happens across the course right. of the day, and then here are the transcripts. Right. Um, but I, I'm not able to do that here, so I'm always, I'm always trying to summarise, and yes, it is in my training to go, what is the, the headline? And I mean, mutual abuse is it? Well, let's talk about mutual abuse, because that wasn't Thursday, but it was a line that came out in a previous newsletter, and people were really, really angry about it. I mean, it, what you, I mean to your defence, I mean... I've been speaking with you since day one and uh, off camera, so I already know or feel that I know mm. over the past two weeks and a half-ish that um, I know you fairly well enough in those two weeks that you are not the kind of person that would go for the jugular in your reporting just because it attracts Thing. Oh yeah, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't you're, try and do it unfairly. I mean, there has to be some you're substance actually, to it. You're actually trying from an open mind, not an Amber side, not a Johnny mm. side, from an open mind, this is what happened today. This is what we're talking about today. And so your quote with mutual abuse actually came from the doctor. And I believe that... Who said it in court that day and it sort of... Dr. Anderson, I believe, Yeah, and right? it, Laurel Anderson. And it rang out in my mind because I thought, ooh. And that's your line for, I believe, your headline yeah, for, for, for the one of the... Yeah, for the Yes, like and um, domestic violence victims um, have spoken up on social media, which I have pointed out that... You know, that mutual abuse technically doesn't exist. Mm. It's an abusive person. Well, let's say it's a highly contested term because if a, if a respected LA doctor is using it, then she must think it, it exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. Mm. And, and it's the fact that there are a lot of domestic violence victims that are in the details of this case. And um, I would believe a majority of them are on the Johnny side based on everybody that shows up to the courthouse. Yeah, and based on a lot of the, the people who kindly funded, you know, my, my, my crowdfunded my journalism. Yeah. So, you know, I need, I need to be mindful of that. So a lot of them disliked the, the headline of mutual abuse. However, I see, based on talking to you, mm. that you were just pulling that line. And, you know, if you really 
looked at the context of how you reported it, you know. You're also, um, if I may, um, and I don't mean to throw a gender stone, but you're a white male mm. from the UK. Who has no direct experience Who doesn't of this. have any that, direct that's, experience. I think that's the crucial thing. And I think that the difficulty with the... Or any professional training in it, I ought to add. You know, it's not something, it's not yeah. an area of expertise that I have because I'm a generalist journalist. I believe that the difficulty that some people had on social media is that you're, you are, you can be seen as brash in your questioning. And I believe that that is a UK style journalism because it's a little bit... So this was about my interview with Debbie in the last... I think so, last, like, yeah. We, I spoke, I've spoken to her about that and since. And you know what? And Debbie was perfectly happy completely with, relaxed about with it. the... Yeah. And, she and, even came up to you this morning and gave you a hug yeah. and said thank you. So when you, this is the thing. When you're interviewing someone, you read, you read them. Yeah. And you're talking to them and you're thinking, well, this person seems to be happy for me to push them or challenge them a little mm -hmm. bit more. You know, if Debbie was getting visibly upset or something, I'd, I'd obviously back off. But you, you've then got to... I suppose, recognize that that might, might your yeah. challenging of someone might have an effect to someone watching it. And that's, yeah. that's really tricky to, to, to cope with. I mean, the gen, I mean, I know people don't have a great um, respect for journalism, but it, it can be quite a tricky sort of balance of priorities and balance of subtleties and nuance. I believe you use the words, it's a, it's a minefield. Oh, well, that's, I mean, that's this case. I mean, I, I've, I've covered lots of difficult and tricky cases over the last 20 years of being a journalist. Yeah. This is like tiptoeing into a minefield is, yeah. because there are so many trigger points and there are so many things that I know will just blow up in my face. And I was kind of prepared for it. I just thought I'm, I'm going to do something that's going to upset people. But I suppose what I want to try and say is that A, I want to learn and, and B, I also want to try and explain a little bit about the journalistic process. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, one of the things that I would say is that, that you mentioned I'm trying to report in court. There is so much information that so comes much. out of court. You know, you, you, you're almost overburdened with it just sitting and listening to it. To then try and formulate it into what is the most interesting thing, what's the top line, what's going to get people um, intrigued by right. what you're writing. You're, you're filtering stuff out. and Down to like a 15 to 20 minute read or But the video. filtering out of stuff, of course, is an editorial process. So you're editorialising by what you're not leaving right, in. Right, right. And people will say, well, you've also shorn it of context. And, I, and I, well, there's two, there's two um, reasons for that. One is because, A, the huge amount of information is... Three reasons. Three reasons. Like Monty Python. The first reason is that there's so much information you're trying to sort of just at least get something that is easily readable or digestible. The second reason is, is that if you um, try to cover it all bases, you know, you, you just get a blancmange. The third reason is kind of laziness. You know, you're kind You'll of thinking... You have to explain that last word. You don't get... You must have blancmanges in, a, in America. What is that? It's a sort of flabby pudding. No. So it's a flabby French pudding, <laughs> and it's sort of it's quite tasty, but okay. it's it's very sort of it's. Is it like flan? It, it's it's a, it's even floppier than a flan. I'd okay. say. Imagine a, imagine a sort of white opaque, jello. Okay. Um, but with a more delicate flavour in it. So if you've got a sort of blancmange of stuff, it's not really sharp. It's the opposite new. of sharpness. Okay. All right. So so, um, the the other thing is you want to try and. Cr get some sort of sense of what it's like to be in the room otherwise we might as well be watching it on telly so um so again you filter out context because the jury is sometimes shorn of context mm -hmm. now if the jury get context like they did with the cut me um, stuff today that goes in my journalism right. because finally they, they get the context so uh, so there is there is that mm -hmm. that is that that is the that is some of the journalistic process and it is difficult and i'm just i'm either going to I'm either going to get it wrong. I'm not entirely sure I have got anything wrong over the last three days, and, you know, but I don't want to upset people. I don't want to trigger people. I don't want to upset supporters of my work. That's counterproductive. Um, but I will get something. I will get something factually wrong. I will get, yeah. you know, make a big error, and that's just bound to happen because I'm here on my own, and I haven't got a producer. I haven't got a team of people You are literally by yourself yeah. and, doing cameras and mics and everything. And I'm loving so. it, and I'm enjoying it. I'm thrilled that I get to meet you and all the other Park Bench interviewees, and I'm delighted that I've, I've been supported in the way I have, and it's, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that I may have misstepped in some way that, that, that has upset people, but I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm and I've obviously... I hate the idea of upsetting anyone, but by the same token, I'm trying to explain that this 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 is what I'm trying to do. This is what I'm trying to achieve, and this yeah. is certain. There are certain things that you have to do, otherwise, you just go back to. I mean, that's when you go back to 2020. I was lucky in 2020. I was just calling it as it happened, right. just literally through my head, eyes, and ears, and fingers, and then transcripts at the end of the day, which 
was the most neutral and objective journalism I've ever been able to produce, but I don't think I'll ever be able to reproduce it simply because you can't do that mm -hmm. here yeah. or indeed anywhere else. Yeah. You know, it was a, a one-off. So that's, that's me trying to explain myself. <laughs> I appreciate it. But is there, you know, go, tell me if there's anything specific that sticks in your mind that you'd want to just say. Um, I mean, you've touched a little bit on everything. It, there, uh, basically, the, the 60 minute interview was another one that uh, stuck out for some with, um, you know, your hypothetical question. Yeah. The, the hypothetical of, well, if he were to, you know, uh, lose this case, then maybe there might be other repercussions mm. in Australia. And, you know, from my point of view, I, I always try to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And I always try to think of things with an open mind. Yes, I know I'm on Johnny's side. And yes, I know that I will probably, regardless of this case, win or lose, be continuing to be a fan of Johnny and watch his movies. Um, because you've seen enough to help you make up your I've own seen mind, enough to, whatever the jury is. Yes, yeah, okay. I've seen enough. And, and the jury didn't, most likely, didn't follow the UK case the way that I, I don't, did. I, well, I don't think they would have seen it at all. Yeah, I, mean, so, I think I mean, they were selected on the basis that they didn't know anything about it. Correct. Mm. And there's, there's miles of evidence that I've seen, and there's now new evidence that we're just now starting to trickle out. Um, and so, for me, I, I'm, I'm Team Johnny all the way. But, but aside from that, I try to think of people with an open mind, even if they're the opposite of mm. what I believe in, because inherently all people are good people until they're not. And I feel that you are good people and that you are doing what you can to be objective. And sure, there might be a day where maybe Johnny didn't do so great in the courtroom based on audios. Like on Thursday was not a great day to listen to some of those things. However, I do still feel that now that it's in context today, it's a better day for him. Mm. So does that make sense? It does make sense. And I, I, just to briefly address the 60 Minutes Australia question, particularly on whether there should be criminal charges um, against Johnny Depp if he's found guilty. I was asked that as a hypothetical, you know, what, and, I, and I said, look, I, I don't really know what the jurisdiction in Australia is like because this, this alleged sexual assault, which didn't come up in cross-examination cross today, Bizarrely, I thought, because I mm. thought they were building up to this. Right. They didn't touch it, which makes me they wonder whether it's gone away completely. Possibly or, there's a lack of evidence. Or, 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 you know, it's been struck out or whether it's going to come up during Amber Heard's testimony. I don't know. But I, I uh, but this alleged sexual assault took place in Australia. So I was asked by the Australian guy, um, if, if he's found guilty, do you think there will be criminal charges against him? And I said, look, I don't know much about the jurisdiction in Australia. But A, if he, if he is guilty, not if he's found, if he is guilty, he should face criminal charges. If he's found guilty, I suspect there will be people in Australia looking to see whether or not criminal charges can be brought. Yeah. Because I believe that if you are guilty of a criminal act, you, you, should, you should face charges. Regardless but, of who we're talking about. But I don't know about, whether he is or regardless, not. <laughs> that, that, that's, regardless that's of who we're talking about, yeah. him or her, mm. you well, are actually, correct. Well, that's the thing. I mean, criminal charges against her, if she, uh, if the jury decides that she's making this up, Lied, and that's a really perjury, interesting, well, assault, I think it would be. Assault, yeah. I think it would be assault. I mean, but but I regardless, it's but what yeah. you're, trying, anyway, what you're trying to say mm. open-mindedly mm. is if he were guilty of these things, mm -hmm. which is a hypothetical question, then charges should be made. Mm. And that if he were to be found guilty, then people will be looking into whether or not charges should right. be brought. So that that was that was my take. Whether I said that take very well after the you know sharp end of a seventeen day. I just think that day. some fans or people who are following this case, they just absolutely cannot accept the possibility that he could be guilty. And I'm I I currently, based on what I know, do not accept that mm. because there hasn't been anything yet that has shown me that he is guilty. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. And so well, even I mean, that, that case, I, mean I, I think I can agree with you there. There is no direct documentary evidence of him ever having laid a finger on Amber Heard. Is there? I mean, we haven't, we haven't seen it anywhere. So and even on the audios, to my knowledge, from what I've listened to, <laughs> hours mm. of, like hours of audio, and I have yet to hear him say that he purposefully harmed her. Mm. I know he accidentally headbutted her. And we've and heard her say her in audio today that, um, uh, which is a new line that, that you, you shouldn't swear on a pod family podcast, um, you effing beat the shit out of me, um, which he didn't immediately deny. And, and he, that, he, that, he brushed over that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that, again, you know, I'm going to put that in the newsletter, that little line, because it's a new line it, and yeah. it's also balanced. It's, it's, it's an allegation that she's made that wasn't 
I don't think fully addressed. And fair journalism, <laughs> it, 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 it does report on both sides. Yeah, but I'm also going to make the point that actually I thought the context that was given to some of the things that we'd heard and been described, well, A, you know, blindingly obvious, it was a joke. And I'm glad, I'm glad we put that one to bed finally. But, but also that, that, that cut me audio, which was so affecting to hear in court on Thursday, now has the context put around it. And his explanation made perfect sense. You know, that, yeah. and so that, that's where we are. Yeah. Oh, we've done a lot over the last 15 minutes or so, right? haven't we? Yeah. Put the world to rights, discuss what I do, discuss what, what happened in court today. Um, I do have a question Go on, yeah, you. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. You did touch on it a yeah. little, but I do want to kind yeah, of highlight go, 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 go. it. From, can you speak personally from a personal standpoint? What are your thoughts? Take the journalism out. Yeah. Come on, Nick. I, do, I, don't, I don't think I can. And the reason I okay. can't is because I successfully haven't said it to anyone. Not, okay. not, not, you know, and I've had good friends come up to me and go, yeah, but what, what, what do you really think? What do you think? And I've, I've been quite disciplined about saying, I'm, I'm not going to give an opinion on okay. this. Because I think it's probably better if educated, I don't. An educated... Um, oh, you're, you're asking a BBC a trained reporter question. to try and second guess a jury. I mean, I, I, I go back to the thing that I, you know, the, there was a lot of surprise at the verdict in London. Um, but the judge in that case had seen more of the evidence than anyone else. And, and you know, we are trained as journalists to respect a, a court's decision. Mm -hmm. just, just as, and just as, and this is really important, whatever many people think about the truth of it and, and whatever they, they've seen, and they may consider the jury to be idiots because they may think that they've considered the evidence um, more than the jury has, depending on what their decision is. If the jury find against Johnny Depp in this, um, it's going to be very, very hard for him. It is going to be very, very hard. I mean, he, a lot of this, a lot has come out in, in, in this trial, but if on both sides of the Atlantic, you have findings against you, which essentially endorse the person you're suing's claims that you were abused. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, there are lots of different paths the jury could take of this, so it's not yeah. going to be a, a sort of black and white thing. Um, it, it doesn't matter what a large subset of people think, society, wider society, the people who haven't been that invested in this case. And you meet them all the time. I and mean, there's a couple of girls from Ohio in the, the queue in front of me who were saying, God, you know, that, that audio on Thursday, that was, oh, I didn't know about that. Yeah. That was really, you know. So people who've only taken a tangential interest in this will just go, well, two court verdicts. Right. Now, what happens if the court verdicts are opposing? What happens Well, if that's, well, I mean, I, I think the obvious thing would be that it makes it very easy for the American public to uh, re-embrace him and just sort of disregard um, the findings of a, of a judge thousands of miles yeah. away, one, one person thousands of miles away. What effect do you think that would have on the UK if... That's, re that's a really interesting question. I don't know because within that jurisdiction, they could still make the claims that they, you know, the Sun newspaper could still call him a wife beater. But then Johnny Depp might, if that, that then gets published there outside the jurisdiction. I was going to say, is there an American umbrella that they could try to publish that in? And well, they, they could, yeah, they could, they could say, right, you're, you, you can put what you like in a British newspaper, but the moment you put that online and that gets read in America, yeah. we're suing. But I mean, I imagine Johnny Depp would not want that. <laughs> No. If he wins this trial, I don't think he's gonna if waste he wins this trial, he will again. get his reputation back. And you know, even if the jury only offer him a dollar of, yeah. of, of, of damages, he will be, you know, his, his, he, he will be somewhat out of the slough of despond he is currently residing in. I yeah, think that's, yeah. that's fair to say. But yeah, no, forgive me. I, I just feel I wouldn't want to offer I know, an off-the-record opinion. You on the spot no, it's there. good. It's good. It's good of you because I, 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 I don't really think I have one yet. But I am. I'm, but it doesn't matter what I think in a way. I'm just trying to sort of navigate my way through this and, and, and get out the information. I, I just want to say I appreciate you as a journalist who has done your best to report for both sides. I know I'm Team Johnny, but I respect mm. the fact but, that but, you but do But Becca, this, is, this to... is a problem. When I do hear this language from America, I'm not reporting for both sides. I'm kind of reporting... Well, what, I, what I mean by that yeah. is you're coming at it from an unbiased point of view and you're picking from the day that yeah. it, that this stuff is happening. Yeah, and sometimes that might feel sensationalist for which I do apologize because I'm not trying to be sensationalist and sometimes that might feel selective and I do apologize but hopefully I've, I've explained how it almost has to be selective to a certain degree and I do appreciate that's what you, you've just said as well. That's how you gain your audience and I get that. I suppose, I suppose so. Such as it is, but I'm very, very grateful to you and appreciative of you for coming on the park bench a second time, Becca. And of course. Having, having, I thought, quite enjoyed that conversation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. My thanks to Becca for her contribution to this episode. Just time to tell you that 
If you want to sign up to the newsletter, that is what is funding my journalism, you can go to reportingdeppbeheard.net slash newsletter. If you want to know what's happening in court tomorrow, Tara Roberts, uh, Johnny Depp's island manager, estate manager on his private island in the Bahamas, will be giving evidence via, live via video link. Then we've got Dr. Shannon Curry lined up. She is a forensic psychologist who will be in court in person. And then finally, if there is time, and this is all subject to change and this is all unofficial as well, we could be hearing from Officer Science from the LAPD. The last I saw of Officer Science was when they were subpoenaed to take part in the trial in the High Court in 2020. And we will see what Officer Science has to say about her experience of being called to the ECB penthouses and the examinations they then made. So that's potentially all happening tomorrow. It's not guaranteed. The only way to find out for sure is to tune into the live feed, which you can get on Law and Crime's YouTube channel. I think Court TV are doing a similar one as well. Or you can stick around for these reports, which will hopefully digest what's been happening over court into bite-sized chunks. Thank you very much, and I'll see you at the next one. Bye-bye.